morning. Pleasure to be here with you today. And it is a beautiful morning. Today is Saturday. Everybody knows to my left, uh, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor, to my right, Robert Mejica, Budget Director for the State of New York. I know today is Saturday because Mr. Metz tweeted at me this morning that today is Saturday. He is the Mets mascot, so it must be Saturday. I also know today is Saturday because I'm not wearing a tie. That is a cue to me to understand that today is not Saturday. Today is Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. It is day 84. Yesterday, a number of my young superstars said to me, you know, this is Memorial Day weekend coming up. And we've been working for 83 straight days. Maybe uh, we do something different. Maybe we take a day off is what they were trying to suggest. I said, OK, tomorrow I'll stay home. So I am at home today. I never said I wasn't going to work. But I said, tomorrow I will stay home. And I am at home today. But. We are working, yes, 84 straight days. When the COVID virus takes a day off, we will take a day off. It's very simple. We're in the New York State Executive Mansion. It's not really my home. It's the people's home. Uh, it is the residence for governors in New York. It's a great old house. It was built in 1856. The state acquired it in 1877. They were building the state capitol, which was going to finish in 1899 which was and is really a beautiful architectural masterpiece. And the governor's residence is just a stone's throw from the state capitol. Uh, and the two work together. The capitol was the place for business, and the governor's residence was the place for uh, social events and for gatherings and to entertain legislators. It's been home to 32 governors. You had three governors who served as President of the United States from New York. You had Grover Cleveland, you had Teddy Roosevelt, uh, and you had FDR, who's uh, between FDR and Teddy Roosevelt, they were the two really historic governors who went on. You had Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, also lived in this home. But it's very much a museum, and it is beautiful. I don't know that you can fully appreciate it today, but we have great artifacts in this home. We have the wheelchair from FDR that uh, he used when he was in this house. It's the wheelchair that he also would go into a pool, which is in the back of the house, uh, which was a pool that he exercised in. It was very important for FDR, obviously, to keep his upper body very strong. He was holding himself up. And swimming was his ex exercise, and that's his wheelchair. We have a great portrait from FDR uh, that hangs in the drawing room. Uh, we have a great bust of Teddy Roosevelt, which was done by Baker, who is an extraordinarily gifted artist, and that's here. We have great art all through uh, this home. The New York State Museum provides art, but we have pieces by Durand here, by Frederick Church, uh, and it's just, uh, you can't appreciate the, the scope of the home, but uh, the whole first floor is just magnificent. It can hold several hundred people, and uh, we do a lot of good work here. My mother did a restoration of the mansion to, back to the historical accurate portrayal when she was here, and it's still basically very much the same way. Uh, so it is beautiful. It's open to the public. We have a website that people can go to, and uh, it's really worth seeing. On the numbers today, the news is good news. It has been good news, but every day is a new day, and uh, it's good to see it continuing. The number of hospitalizations are down. The change in hospitalizations is down. The intubations is down. The number of new cases, uh, new COVID cases walking in the door, which is a very important number, that's down. And the number of lives lost is down to 84. 84 is still a tragedy, no doubt. But 
The fact that it's down as low as it is is really uh, overall good news. I had a conversation with a healthcare professional once, and I said, you know, what, what number should I be looking to, for uh, to get down as a bottom number on the deaths? And uh, the doctor said, it wasn't our health commissioner, he said, if I were you, I would look for 100. You want to be below 100. Uh, and I said, why 100? He said, well, people are going to pass away when they're ill, uh, and often it's pneumonia or it's something else. But uh, if you can get under 100, I think you can breathe a sigh of relief. When he said this to me, we were in the hundreds and hundreds, and getting below 100 was almost impossible. But I made a little note. You know, you need something in life to shoot for. You need something to aim for. And it's not official. I don't even know if it was 100% accurate. But in my head, I was always looking to get under 100. And we're under 100. Uh, doesn't do any good for those 84 families that are feeling the pain. But uh, for me, it's, it's just a sign that we're making real progress. And I feel good about that. Uh, we've been talking about reopening and how we proceed with reopening. It's been different in different regions all across the state. Uh, we have criteria all across the state that applies to every region. There is no variance in the criteria region from region. There is no political difference. There is no uh, uh, local differences. Uh, what's safe in Buffalo is safe in Albany, is safe in New York City. And I want people to know where we are with these criteria, and that's why they're on the website, and I encourage people to go look at them every day. Uh, they are controlling what's happening. This is all a function of what people do. This has nothing to do with government, nothing to do with anything else. This is what people do. Uh, and New Yorkers have been great in understanding the situation and responding. In the Mid-Hudson area, Westchester, Rockland, Dutchess, Orange, Putnam, Sullivan, Ulster, we have met the criteria for the decline in number of deaths. That was the issue that we were having uh, with the Mid-Hudson region. The only open issue is we have to train tracers. No region opens before it's ready to open. To be ready to open, you need the tracing and testing system in place. Uh, Mid-Hudson region, we have identified the right number of tracers. They now need to be trained. It's an online course. I spoke this morning uh, to the representatives of the Mid-Hudson, the county executives, and I said, look, we have a choice. If we can get them trained over Memorial Day weekend, we can reopen on Tuesday. You can do these trainings online. Uh, many of them are government employees, and uh, we agreed, and I thank the county executives and supervisors, uh, we agreed to ask people to be trained Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and we'll open in the Mid-Hudson on Tuesday. So that is good news. Uh, Long Island, the number of deaths are dropping. If that continues, uh, we also have to get the tracing online, but at this rate, uh, we uh, could open by Wednesday if the number of deaths continues to decline and we get that tracing up. So uh, that is also very good news. Memorial Day weekend is here. We opened up the state beaches. We asked people to socially distance. This is Jones Beach yesterday, and people were great. People were great. They're doing what they're supposed to do, and I thank them very much. Uh, in terms of testing, the, we, we stress this. Uh, and we should, just because you are not uh, showing symptoms does not mean you do not have the COVID virus. About a third of people who have the virus never have symptoms, so they never know that they have the virus. But you can still spread it if you have it, even if you don't know you have it. So that's one of the insidious elements to this virus. So, uh, get a test. We are trying to make it as easy as possible. We're opening more and more testing sites. We now have, uh, we're working with Advantage Care Physicians. We're bringing more testing to lower income communities. But we now have 760 testing sites across the state. 
uh, please go to the website and get a test. It protects you, it protects your family, it protects everyone. Uh, and we, we've made it as easy as possible, but we do have many sites that have more capacity than they're now doing tests. If you have any symptoms, get a test. If you were exposed to a person who turned out to be positive, get a test. If you're a frontline worker, get a test. If you're a healthcare worker, get a test. Uh, if you're working in a grocery store, you're delivering products, you're public facing, get a test. If you're a region that's opening up, get a test. Uh, and look, we've made it as easy as possible, but uh, this is something where we, we need people to continue to step up, right? This is not you, and by the way, just because you got a test one month ago doesn't mean you shouldn't go get another test, right? You can get a test and you can walk out of the testing site uh, and pick up a virus in 10 minutes. So it's not, I got one test, I'm done. It doesn't work that way. Uh, but again, that's up to people. And all these admonitions, all these pleas, the good news is remember that it is working. What we are doing is working. You look at the New York curve, you look at how low it is, you look at the number of deaths, you look at the decline, compare that with the rest of the nation where you still see the rest of the nation's curve going up. So it is working. And what are we, what are we doing? It is the social acceptance and culture of being New York tough, which is smart, smart. Smart is get the test. Smart is protect yourself. Smart is risk reward. Don't put yourself in a situation where it's not worth it. If you can stay home, stay home. If you don't have to go into a certain store, don't go into a store. Uh, we're united, we're disciplined. This is all about discipline now. This is doing the same thing we did the day before, even though it's day 84. Uh, and it's showing respect and love for your family and for society and operating that way. And again, it's working here in New York because what you're seeing across the other rest of the country, in many other states, you're seeing the numbers go up. They're talking about a possible second wave in the South, which may have reopened too fast and too aggressively. Uh, they're talking about uh, a higher number of deaths in California. Uh, how these counties reopen, how states reopen, they can make all the difference. Uh, 24 states uh, suggest uh, that uh, you may still have uncontrolled spread, right? So don't underestimate this virus. Uh, we know that it can rear its ugly head at any moment. Uh, but what do we need to do? It's not rocket science, wear a mask, wash your hands, socially distance, use hand sanitizer, but most of all, wear a mask. I am telling you, those masks can save your life. Those masks can save another person's life. And the most astonishing fact to me, all through this, that the emergency room health professionals have a lower infection rate than the general population. That the bus drivers, transit workers, police officers have a lower rate of infection because the masks work and we gave them the masks and they wore the masks. So wear a mask. We have an ongoing competition on the wear a mask ad, the most convincing ad. Mariah, my daughter's running this because uh, she was unmoved by my powers of communication and persuasion. But that competition is now open and uh, we have people voting on the five finalists and the winner will be announced Tuesday and will become a public service announcement for the state. We're asking people to go to the website look at the five finalists and vote, uh, and then we will announce a winner. Uh, I'm excited about this, and uh, we are going to uh, 
be stressing wearing a mask over this weekend and uh, going to this website and this competition is part of it. Uh, we have Rachel Maddow, who has a show on MSNBC at night that uh, I have been on, and she was talking about this competition last night uh, in her way, and uh, she made some remarks that I would like to show you if we can. New York asked people to submit their own public service announcements about why you should wear a mask. Um, and what they circulated this week was what I, I believe are the finalists, like the best ones according to the state. And they're really good. They're also really, really, really New York. Now, that really, really, really New York comment, uh, Rachel is by birth a Californian, I believe. Really, really, really New York. I'm curious what she meant by really, really, really New York. So I want her to do New York a favor and go look at the five, pick which ad she likes best. Uh, and uh, I'm asking all New Yorkers to go and vote on which ad they like best. But I'm really, really curious what Rachel thinks is the best of the five ads. So I'm publicly asking her to go look and vote and let us know what she likes best of the five. We are also posting some honorable mentions because we had over 600 submissions, and I'm telling you, they're phenomenal. I've been watching them. They are just phenomenal. Uh, but we have an honorable mention category. We want to show you five more uh, videos now that are in the honorable mention category. I wear a mask when I go grocery shopping. When I take the subway. Every time I leave the house. I wear a mask for my friends and neighbors. To help others feel safe. Because I don't know if I'm carrying the virus. For my family members who are immune suppressed. To protect essential workers. For my sister who's my best friend. The people at the laundromat. I wear a mask to flatten the curve. Keep the community We're in these together. For all New York. In hopes that you will too. COVID-19 has put New York on hold. Since we cannot track this virus, it's hard for New Yorkers to move forward. But there is something we can do to fight against it. Wearing a mask in public protects you and dramatically lowers the chances of COVID-19 infecting others. Even if you feel healthy, wearing a mask shows New Yorkers that you care about them and our essential workers. So if you're in a public space, indoors or out, please wear a mask and help New York get back in motion. Okay, um, last point, in this house, uh, staying here, and as I said, it really feels like a museum in many ways, but you, you can't uh, ignore just the number of greats who lived in this home, historic greats, uh, what FDR did, what Teddy Roosevelt did, uh, and I, I read a lot of history. New York tough, uh, yes, yes, this is a tough situation. And yes, New Yorkers are tough. 
Uh, and we've shown how tough we are here. Uh, tough means many things, as I've said, loving, disciplined, etc. But even tough is tough. Yeah, tough is about courage. Teddy Roosevelt, courage is not having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. Day 84, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. We have to do it more. We have to continue to do it. And this new normal, we're going to have to do it for a long time. Uh, they're talking about the fall. They're talking about a possible second wave. We have to get back to activity. But we have to do it in a different way, a smarter way, uh, maybe a better way when all is said and done. And that's courage. And Teddy Roosevelt was a tough uh, and leaned into being tough. He liked being tough, Teddy Roosevelt. He liked being physically tough. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a boxing ring built on the third floor of this house, a boxing ring. And he would challenge the legislators during the day to come box with him in the boxing ring on the third floor at night. Can you imagine that? Governor says to a legislator, come, we'll go into the boxing ring. I think that's how they got the budget done at the end of budget session. Any discordant voices, come to the mansion and we'll go to the boxing ring. But he was, he was tough in that sense, rough rider, tough, uh, physically tough, pushed himself. My father was governor of New York, lived in this house for 12 years as governor, served as governor. He had a different version of tough. Uh, he was more of the loving definition of tough. He was more of the inclusive uh, definition of strong, that strength was in unity and strength was in community. Uh, and strength was in giving and selflessness. And strength was finding the commonality among people and connecting among people. That's his sense and his definition of toughness. This nation at its best is at its best only when we see ourselves, all of us, as one family. And he brought it back to the metaphor of a family, that what is society, what is community? It's a family. You're a family. Just treat each other's as you would treat your own family members, sharing benefits and burdens. Uh, that was his version of tough. So you can have a, no a number of iterations of the same concept, but the concept is right, and that concept is New York. Questions? Governor, the Associated Press in its own count has found more than 4,500 recovering COVID patients from hospitals were released into nursing homes under the state directive that was in effect for nearly two, two months. What, does, what did your state survey numbers show on this, and why two weeks after the survey are you not releasing the results of the survey? We had 68,000 hospitalizations. Uh, I don't, so the 4,000 number would be a subset of that. Uh, and I don't know what information we have that we haven't released at this point. Do you know? No, I don't think there's any information that we have that we haven't released at this point. But I just want to reiterate once again that the policy that the Department of Health put out was in line directly with the March 13th directive put out by CDC and CMS that read, and I quote, nursing homes should admit any individuals from hospitals where COVID is present. Not could, should. That is President Trump's CMS and CDC. So I know that there's been a lot of discussion on this topic. There are over a dozen states that did the exact same thing, many of whom were concerned about hospital capacity. At the time, everybody remembers the projections were well into the 140,000 hospital bed range, whereas we started out with, I think it was about 50,000. Um, and so obviously any death is an unfortunate death, but and even when you look at in comparison to other states, New Jersey has 5,522 confirmed nursing home deaths, whereas New York is 3,094, Massachusetts 3,755, Connecticut 1,487. It's been a national and international tragedy that everybody has had to grapple with, and it is something that we're trying to learn from every day and move forward. 
Yeah, I see. Let me just let me just come in on that. The look, we're in a political environment here. I get it. I understand it. I'm a big big boy. Uh, I can say all day long. I refuse to politicize this discussion, and I have not, and I will not, because I represent Democrats and Republicans, and independents, and atheists, and short people, and tall people, and the politics makes no difference to me. Uh, I have no political agenda. I have no political aspirations. There's no politics here. The I can say that, but we're still in an election year and people are still playing politics and this is a hyper-partisan environment. To the extent people want to politicize this issue and Republicans are saying, uh, well, New York did this, New York followed the president's agency's guidance. So that depoliticizes it. What New York did was follow what the Republican administration said to do. That's not my attempt to politicize it. It's my attempt to depoliticize it. So don't criticize the state for following the president's policy. Do you believe that having thousands of those patients coming into nursing homes had absolutely nothing to do with the high number of infections and deaths that we've seen in New York? Uh, yeah, we've, we've gone through the infection rate uh, many times, and there's nothing has changed. The three regions that opened last weekend, how likely is it that they'll enter phase two in this coming weekend? We're watching the numbers. We're watching the numbers. We said two weeks between phases. Okay. That's a rule of thumb. Uh, there is no magic or science to that. That's not a hard and fast number. That, where the two weeks comes from, is, uh, quote unquote, experts say, that's the margin of time that you have to leave to see if an infection did increase, and then the uh, infection incubated, and then the infection manifested, and then the person got ill, and then the person went into the hospital. That would take about two weeks. Uh, but if you see no increase in any of the numbers, could you accelerate that? Yes. Did they decide to move to phase two, or did you decide to move to phase two? Just procedurally. The phase two is different than phase one, because phase one is basically a hard start or stop, right? Either you hit this number or you don't hit this number. Phase two, and Rob will come, correct me if I'm wrong, phase two uh, is more a judgment call of uh, when have the numbers stabilized, to the extent there is an increase, can you explain the increase, or is the increase problematic? But I don't think we have a hard, the two weeks I explained, uh, I don't know that there are a hard set of numbers for phase two. Right. No, there's no, the two weeks is not set, as the governor points out, it relates to the CDC guidelines in relation to the 14-day incubation period. Um, however, to go to phase two, we would modify the executive order and then put out all of the guidelines for all of the phase two um, industries. So those are being prepared now, those will be ready. So if we don't see any uptick in the health metrics, and it says, as the governor pointed out previously, you still have a green light, nothing has gone to yellow, then those regions would move to phase two or monitoring each region. Governor, yesterday you signed an executive order uh, allowing, allowing gatherings of up to 10 people. How do you think that's going to affect the infection rate in the state and the, ability, and the state's ability to reopen? Uh, theoretically, it shouldn't. It's a CDC guideline uh, also, the 10 people. Uh, gatherings up to 10. And look, it's, it's the same answer to all of these questions, right? It depends on how people act. You can have a safe gathering of 10 people. You can also have a wholly unsafe gathering of 10 people. You can have an unsafe gathering of three people. You can have an unsafe gathering of two people. It only takes two. Or you can have a safe gathering of 10. You know, it depends on what people do. Did you feel pressure to make that move due to the night flu lawsuit that was filed on Friday? I didn't even know about a lawsuit on this one. 
No, and look, on any given day, if we don't have three lawsuits, something's going wrong. Governor, just because at this rate you can have a gathering of more than 10 people, should you be having a gathering of more than 10 people? Can you say it again? Just because the executive order says you can have a gathering of up to 10 people, should people be gathering in that? No, look, this is, this is the whole point. All of these are measuring risk, right? Risk reward. My daughter Michaela's here today. Risk reward, it's one of my constant lectures. Is it worth the risk? Two people is a risk, three people is a risk, four people is a risk, five people is a risk, 10 people is a risk. The risk keeps going up. Any one of those people could be infected, any one of those people could be infected and not know it, any one of those people could be infected, love you to death and still give you the coronavirus and then you could give it to someone and it could kill someone. So is it worth the risk? You have to make that judgment. That's why I'm saying it has nothing to do with government at the end of the day. What is my role as governor? I have a whole operational role, get the hospitals running, get testing, get tracing, et cetera. But vis-a-vis -vis people and the virus spread, I just give them the information and then say, please, here are the facts. Please exercise diligence and judgment. Please, please. And here's what happens on you if you don't. And here are the facts, and now you weigh the risk reward. But if you don't have to be with a group of 10 people, don't be with a group of 10 people. It doesn't mean, OK, governor signed an executive order up to 10. Let's now have a party of 10 people. No. Governor, considering the, the rising rates. Last one, Mr. Jesse. Go ahead. In, uh, considering the rising rates in, in highly populous regions like Los Angeles County, Illinois, Texas, places that do a lot of travel in between New York and, uh, and those locations, is there anything that you are considering, like future measures, to stop that second wave, considering that those regions seem to not have this under control? If you're asking, would New York now quarantine against people coming from other locales into New York because they could be bringing a virus here. I don't think, uh, first, mobility is way down, right? You have many, you have few, less tourism, less business travelers, et cetera. Uh, so on the numbers, I don't know how big an influx it is. Uh, also, Jesse, I don't know that legally at one state can bar other states from entrance. Uh, and I don't think it is good policy. I know when the shoe was on the other foot, uh, there was talk of other states saying, well, I'm going to quarantine against New Yorkers coming here. Uh, I thought it was wrong then, and uh, I think it's wrong now. Excuse me, let me just finish your question, Jesse. Go ahead, Jesse. Can I just finish? Can I just can I finish Jesse's question? I, I guess the, the only follow-up is: Is there anything in the toolbox? Is there any? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, cutting down on flights from places like that to, to kind of prevent, or what sort of thinking are you going through? in order to prevent a second wave? Well, look, the second wave, uh, you can have people who come from outside and infect your population, right? That's how we got here in the first place. Where I'm really outraged is uh, how the infection, how we got infected from Europe when nobody told us. It was all about China, and we're all looking to the West on people coming from China, China travel ban. Meanwhile, it came from the East, and it came from Europe. And nobody ever said, watch out for those European travelers. Uh, they could be bringing the coronavirus, because by the time we closed down China, the virus had already left China and was in Europe, and then we have three million Europeans come. That's how this happened which is still mind-boggling to me, that with all these global health organizations, with all these global health experts, public health experts, federal agencies, whole alphabet soup, nobody realized that the virus had left China and gone to Europe, and nobody realized that people from Europe 
were then traveling all over the world and bringing the virus. And nobody realized that planes from Europe land at JFK in Newark Airport. I mean, that is still, to me, mind boggling. But that's how it came here in the first place. Uh, New York, a state government does not have the capacity. Look, I couldn't have done anything about it anyway, except yell, right? Legally, the state can't close its borders to uh, European uh, visitors. That's a federal action. I don't believe a state can control, close its borders to other states. I believe legally that would be challenged, and uh, I'm not even sure the federal government could do that. Uh, so I don't believe there's a state role in setting borders. Uh, but even if we do get infected by someone, the question really then turns to controlling that infection, and that's testing, tracing, et cetera. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow, guys. We'll go through it tomorrow. I will talk to you tomorrow. Save the questions, and we'll do it. You'll go first tomorrow.